I want to um, just talk a little bit about your background, um, just so we can learn a little bit more about you. So if you could all just tell us what kind of projects you're working on right now and what your specific area of expertise is in the interior design industry, that would be great. Hi, everyone. Um, so at Perkins Eastman in Chicago, we actually focus mostly on senior living, and we're trying to branch out into some corporate interiors and higher ed. So that's what, that's what I focus on. Hi, um, I'm a designer at Gary Lee Partners, and at Gary Lee we have several projects from corporate interiors to high-end single-family residential. Um, we do a lot of hospitality work, so um, we have both architects and designers on staff. Currently I'm primarily working on some university projects, um, as well as uh, some hospital projects, uh, and my background uh, in interiors is primarily commercial interiors and hotels. Hi. Um, as principal of the uh, uh, Box Studios, I'm actually working on all kind of things. So corporate, um, healthcare, fitness, student housing, base building, um, architecture, uh, fitness, wellness, so kind of the whole gamut. Contrary to my fellow panelists, um, I work for Hayworth. In Hayworth, we have a showroom on the third floor, so if you haven't visited, please do before the end of the day. Um, so we develop furniture, architectural products, um, every technology that um, transforms spaces. So projects that I work on, I'm working on a lot of projects currently, um, mostly in workplace, um, also with higher education, um, healthcare, architectural. So I, and I partner with actually all of these <laughs> lovely people next to me here in Chicago. So. All right, great, thank you guys. Um, so the first thing I want to start talking about is uh, design school, which is where most of these students are right now. I'm curious, um, what was the best advice you ever received as a student? I'll jump in. I think uh, probably the best advice I got was to work with people and never just try to do it alone. Um, I know studio projects are, are individual and that's how you work, uh, but it's nice that you can have an objective eye and that somebody can take a look at your project criticize it after you worked on it for 12 hours and get a different perspective on, uh, on how the design goes. So um, I always thought that was really good advice, to be around people and work with your colleagues to, uh, uh, to get some perspective, I guess. Uh, I, I would add to that as well that you, you sh everyone should be patient when you're out of school. I mean, you're, it's not going to be the same as when you're in studio working on design for yourself. Um, you know, you're going to be moving to an environment where you, you're not necessarily going to be doing the exact same thing. So try to be, the advice I've always got was be patient. Realize that when you get out of school, it's not going to be the same as school. Um, you know, it won't be just about fun things that you get to work on. That's not, I realize it's not always fun. But, um, you know, and you kind of have to get through a process first when you get out. Um, I would say take your time while you're in school to experience different practice areas within your internships. Um, a lot of times I think it's easy to get you know, stuck into one practice area without really experiencing um, different ones or even different size firms. Um, so really taking that, that time to, to evaluate who you want to be as a designer and where you think you might want to go because what you, what you might want to be is something completely different from you know, your freshman year to your junior year. So taking the time to experience all of that. Now, Hillary, you mentioned taking the time to experience everything in design school. What do you think are some things um, in design school that students should definitely take advantage of that they don't always do so? Hillary or anyone else on the panel. Yeah. Um, one of the things I would say is if your school offers other courses outside of just interiors or architecture, whether it being graphics or um, in industrial design, school is the time to take that. I mean, it's it's all out there in front of you, and if, the, if someone has another a class or something outside of the school that you can get involved in, um, that would be something. And the other thing I would say, I want to just add on to the last question, was um, traveling and getting as much experience as you can, even whether, whether you're allowed to, you know, whether your courses offer any travel experience or if you can get a road trip and go somewhere and it helps you get ideas of, of culture and um, different types of buildings. Because when you get out in the, in the real world, you are on some really glorious projects and sometimes you're not. So having that experience of being different places really helps 
broaden your expertise. I'm going to jump on that as well. I, um, I studied in Versailles, France for about a year, and uh, it really opened my eyes to a lot of different things. I was on this cusp of uh, potentially changing majors from maybe architecture, industrial design, and um, I studied a year abroad, and it, and just, it basically turned my life around. Uh, just maybe not necessarily uh, all focused on design, but culture and um, meeting different people and how people work or live and, and, and really exposing yourself to those different experiences, I think, um, are, are, are things that can even you know, put in your pocket and make you better or get some ideas that way. So yeah, I like that. And, and I can expand upon that too, that I think it's so important that you have to have heart in what you do. So figure out what that is, you know, find that something within the design industry because it is vast. There's all types of parts of design and architecture that you can explore that touches different type of people. Um, there's so much blending of science and design, so science and art. Um, so if that excites you, so just, I guess, find your passion and find what really gets you excited and just keep digging, never stop learning. Um, and that was something, as a design student, was told to me, just never stop learning. Keep, you'll get out of your career what you put in. Um, so just find things that make you tick and make you excited to be doing what you do every day. Because like you, we were talking about earlier, that not every single project is going to be that magical experience, um, but just always looking at ways to educate yourself. Now, when you all were in school, uh, when you were students, where in the design profession did you see yourselves and did you guys end up there or were there quite a few curves on the road where you're at now? Um, I, I was really drawn to healthcare, but I didn't really start there. I started more in corporate interiors and then went to more cultural work and higher ed. And I landed in senior living. So it's kind of healthcare, but it's a blend with you know hospitality and residential and everything in between. So. Um, my, my background actually is architecture. I have my bachelor and my master's in architecture. And so um, for the past few years, I've actually worked at architecture firms. And right now I'm working at um, architecture and interiors. But it's helping me personally to grow in both, um, in both fields. And it's important to work with designers and work with architects to kind of bridge the gap in between um, those two experiences. So. Um. I'll be honest, I didn't really see myself as a leader when I was in school. I, I saw myself more as a, maybe being a role player. Um, and as I uh, moved through the industry and started uh, trying to go to different firms, um, I started to realize that I had, you know, I had uh, leadership capabilities that I didn't think I had. So I, you know, I, I did that by moving to different firms that I thought were very different than what I was doing currently, um, deliberately, so that I would keep challenging myself. Um, I didn't know if it would work out, but ultimately it didn't. I found out a lot about myself. Since we're going in a row here, um, f for me, it, when I was traveling, I actually journaled uh, when I was when I was in Europe, and I wrote like three or four things down. So one was uh, to start my own firm. Um, the second one is to to get published. Um, third one was also to do work outside of the area you, you're in. So I, I was told if you don't write that down, that it it becomes a dream. So if you write it down and you shoot for those things, you, you can, I'm not necessarily a list person, but um, you can check those things off. So if you actually physically put it down on paper, it's a little bit easier to, to kind of find that goal. Uh, so for me, that was kind of uh, what I was trying to do, which, which right now I'm you know, lucky enough to have that right now. Yeah. Um, you know, and, oops. <laughs> um, and my role, being a little bit different than the others here on the panel, but I had the same education and background. Um, I thought I was going to move and I was interviewing with big firms in the city. I'm originally from St. Louis, um, a smaller town, and I wanted to be in the big city and birthplace of architecture and be at Perkins and Will or a Gensler or something, and I'm gonna be the next design star. And then ultimately I started interviewing with firms as well as companies on the manufacturing side of, of things. And I fell in love with the business of design, if that makes sense, uh, and a different side of the industry. Um, and when I started to go through the process, I realized before I even chose interior design or architecture as my degree that um, 
I was undecided when I first got to the University of Missouri, and I was um, looking at education, of possibly being a teacher. I was also looking at psychology, because I loved psychology, um, how the brain works and how people interact with their built environment. So then I was looking at interior design. And now I'm looking at my role and this side of the industry that it kind of, I get to blend all three of those things. So um, that was kind of my story of how I, I took the leap of faith when my parents were definitely telling me, like, what are you doing? You just got your degree and you're supposed to be a designer. And now I'm going into the dark side of sales. <laughs> um, but we're all salespeople. Do not forget that. Even in design, you have to sell. Um, but anyways, so that, yeah, I don't, I guess, you know, there's so many other avenues. So just find your skill set and your passion and just there's going to be an avenue to, you know, within the industry, there's a lot of options. So, Thank you, guys. Um, now I just want to switch gears a little bit and start talking about interviews and then the eventual internships and jobs that hopefully come out of those interviews. Um, can someone just give me a brief list of things that students should definitely know how to do coming out of design school, trying to enter into the design industry? What is a list of things that students should definitely know how to do? I think when you start interviewing, make sure that you understand who you're interviewing with. Um, so do your research uh, before you go for an interview and understand who that firm is, who that person is you might be sitting down with. Um, grammatical errors, always double check your work. That's huge for us. Sometimes we won't even call in somebody if we find simple things like that um, wrong on resumes or portfolios. Um, those are just two big, big things. I think I, Hillary's exactly right. Um, it's important to look up who you are. If I, you, I know you apply to several places. We've all been there, um, and you, you send everything out. But when you do get that interview, you really need to know who you're speaking to and about that firm, why you want to work there, because they're going to ask you that question. So be prepared why you want to, why you want to work there. And also be honest about your skill set. I would say that's something, if you don't know, say Revit, for example, and the firm is solely in Revit, um, say you know you've experienced it if you have and then you're willing to take a class or a course or somehow how can you prepare yourself to um for that job but i'd just say being being honest about about your skill set uh, yeah i would i would reiterate some of that I, I think in terms of what should be on your resume figure out what you're going to be doing and then make sure that's on your resume so if you are going to be drafting or if you're going to be doing visualization rendering make sure you have at least one drafting tool that you're really good at in your resume and some other visualization tool, Photoshop, Rhino, whatever it is, should be there when you get out of school. Um, I'd also add uh, your cover letter should be written really well because if, if it's not written really well, it probably tells me that you're not someone who can write a really good letter or an email as well, which is something that I value really a lot when I, for someone who gets out of school that can communicate directly with other uh, consultants or contractors or clients. Uh, I'm going to kind of jump on that. So outside of what those things are, because I, I think a lot of people should have that, I mean, minimally, right? So when I look at resumes, um, we get so many, right? I'm sure you guys are in the same boat. So make a friend. So what happens on my end is I usually look at resumes that come from a friend. And so a uh, Melissa uh, of the world, my colleagues here, Hillary, um, you make friends and they say this person was fantastic at school or easy to work with or uh, very talented, whatever the case is, and that will get you even closer because if you look around and, and if you guys are not working, um, you're competing against each other. So the easiest way, at least to get your foot in the door, is to make a friend and see if they can refer uh, of some sort. Your teacher would be another. Uh, person there. So I would say that. And the second thing is, um, outside of the stuff you're bringing, make a connection. M make a connection with your interviewer. For, for some, you know, the, the two minutes before you, go, or, or you're going in, before you formalize the interview, um, make mention. You might see a picture of their kids. You might see a golf trophy. Um, I always kind of connect back to that and would say, oh, I see you're a golfer. Uh, where have you golfed? Or, you know, connect in that way. Or I see your kids in soccer. Oh, my kid's in soccer. Oh, where do you live? Oh, I live in the Grange. I live in the Grange. 
So when you make that connection, it, it becomes a little closer. Uh, you end up might you might know connections that would then take you to a different level. I end up looking at those uh, resumes a little differently uh, than being more objective uh, in a sense because we get so many. Yeah, and on that too, that you know, this is a relationship business. Um, it's people oriented. It's um, trust and, and confidence that you're going to deliver a great experience of, of carrying out a project for them on time, on budget, all those things. But was that experience enjoyable? Um, so a lot of times when I'm in networking events or um, you know, meeting students, other professionals in the industry, you know, I can sense that kind of character of like, you know, they really, they really care, they're engaged, um, you know, and that, t those types of referrals, I'm, I'm always happy to give to somebody like Ferd and, you know, others in the room. So um, build your network because it is such a relationship driven business. Um, clients are going to also rate the experience of your firm and your firm's going to grow by having good experience with the people. It's all about the people. So I think when you're uh, looking at firms and interviewing with firms, make sure you're kind of taking in what's happening around you, the interactions between the other people at the firm. Is this some place that allows me to thrive and get excited about being in this type of environment? You know, does it feel, how does it feel? So, you know, do, do I see myself working here? And that's an important piece. And, you know, evaluate that when you're going into different interviews. Can I jump on that as well? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, Hillary, actually, I just met on the field uh, somewhere at a, an event, and she had asked me if she could bring her students, she teaches as well, to my office. They, they, they went through the experience. Probably two weeks later or so, I had said, do you recommend anybody out of your, your class? Can you send me you know, two people that you recommend. And she did send that over. We actually interviewed both those people, and one of them is actually an intern with us now. This is such an important point, um, this whole discussion right now. Networking is so crucial. Um, I can probably guarantee that most of us found one, if not many of our positions, through knowing somebody um, or being put in connection with somebody who's looking. And so it's not it's never too late to start networking and it's never too early so whether you're a freshman or a senior get out there and start meeting people and i know a lot of times um, it's not easy to get out there on your own so bring a wingman you you know like make sure you have somebody there with you to kind of start introducing you know making introductions to other people um, it's it's the best way to get out there and to meet new people and to find connections that will lead to positions. What would you say to students who are uncomfortable with networking? What advice would you give them? Just like anything, it takes practice. No one is perfect at it, and you have to know that it's going to be difficult at first if this is something that's hard for you, but the more you do it, the better you'll get. And trust me, you'll go to one event with your wingman, and you meet somebody, and then the next one you go to, you'll know somebody else there that knows somebody. And it, it picks up really quickly. Um, but that's what our whole profession is about. You're, you're dealing with people, with clients, with, with reps, with other designers and architects. Like you've, you, it's something to just step out of your shell and um, you know, it gets easier with time, it does. <laughs> I would agree. The, the best way to get good at networking is just continue to do more networking uh, and try to find a way to make it fun for you. I mean, like Hillary said, bring a few friends. I mean, I used to, I don't like it doing it now, but when I was younger, I would make it into a game. I'm going to hand out 10 cards tonight. I will not leave until I hand out 10 business cards and shake 10 hands. That's it. And after you're done, that's great. I mean, then you kind of make it into a game. You, you first want to do that, anything like that. Just try to find a way to make it a little less stressful. I, I would add just like general tips on top of all of that is just make sure you have enough business cards. Um, when, no, I mean, I made the mistake before where I completely forget and then you, you know, you, you just want to have enough. Um, make sure that when you shake somebody's hand, you shake it hard with intent um, and you look them in the eye. I think that's, those are just like really simple things, but people remember that. Um, and then the other bit of advice that I would give is when you do meet somebody and they give you their business card, the next morning, maybe follow up with them with a phone call or even an email and just say, you know, it was really nice to meet with you. Um, you know, maybe we'll see around, maybe we'll see each other around, the, you know, in the next week or so or at another event. And, you know, if, if, they're, if they have you in their mind, 
they'll remember you when you know a potential position comes up again. There's, so uh, there, I was going to say there's something that um, if you do something ten thousand times, you you would be an expert at that, right? So uh, I didn't necessarily like being in front of people myself, and I think as I, I started teaching, it, it was much easier to go through that, and then. Um, as a teacher as well, I would bring as many uh, jurors in, and I'd always preface my class by saying, hey, listen, this is your opportunity. Grab a card. If you're interested in what they do, grab their card. And from that is the, you know, hey, you know, an email. I met you at the, you know, the, the, the jury event at uh, school. Um, is there any opportunity that we could do, uh, like, a lunch? And uh, just tell me, you know, what's going on in the business. And that in yourself is that's the key to get in. Uh, don't be scared, don't be shy about that. I would say like 95% of the people will say absolutely. Do you guys agree? Mm -hmm. So uh, be active, I mean, and, 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 and involved. And um, yeah, not, don't, don't be scared to do that. I, I'm very comfortable that, that a lot of us have, have been in your position before and understand and, and um, uh, how difficult it is to get that first job. So um, be, be out there, be active. It is scary, but what's wrong with asking for somebody's card and what they do? That, that's not really difficult to, to really ask. Yeah, I mean, I guess on that, that's a practice that they're mentioning. I mean, I'm in sales and I talk to people and present every day and I still sometimes get, like I have this thing that I get red here if I'm starting to get a little nervous still happens you know it's eventually I'm just and I know that I just have to keep doing it keep doing it and it'll get more comfortable and that eventually it won't feel so scary I mean I remember talking I was trying to build a network in Chicago to get a job and move out of St. Louis because that was my dream so when I was getting leads from some people at my internship in in Missouri they knew some people in Chicago. I mean, these are like, you know, six degree of separation from me, right? Or more or whatever. Um, and so very cold calling. Um, and I was shocked at how warm and friendly people were totally open for me. I asked for a cup of coffee when I'm going to be in Chicago in a couple months. And they're like, okay. You know, but I also, a lot of those people that I reached out to to ask for that meeting, I had a call three, four, or five times, and I was getting a lot of coaching from parents, my boss at the time, I was just saying, like, if you're not gonna get the phone call and we're, you know, email back in a day, you know, this, is, this could be a couple months process. So just that follow-up, 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 it's okay, people are busy, and don't worry, you're not bugging them. I mean, it just, it, it's just the reality of business, right? We just sometimes are so busy that those things we don't get back to right away, but it's not that we don't care or trying to help people out, we're all, generally nice people in our industry. <laughs> so we're happy to help, help out, but just be persistent and don't, and be confident. You know, like if you want something and you want to meet somebody, ask for it and keep pushing for it until you get it. Um, and I think that that persistence then looks really good to a potential employer, so. How do you determine in the very short time that you spend with a potential employee that they would be a good fit for your for firm or your company? I, I feel like um, culture, like if you know the culture of that firm and who, you know, how they work or what projects they do, I feel like I could almost see like in the first five minutes. So, of course, I've seen the sample work. Of course, I, you know, that's why they're in. So they got in. So how are they going to communicate culturally? How, how, would they, um, how would they be able to work with my team? Uh, so I think culture... Uh, personality, outgoingness, willingness to learn, um, you know, those kind of uh, characteristics, you, you could almost tell right away. So you can feel when somebody's more reserved and a little more um, nervous, and we take that with, you know, with a grain of salt. We, we know people are nervous, but just how they present themselves and how they speak and how they look in you in the eye, uh, can, you, um, can you walk through your project in a... Uh, uh, concise uh, order, uh, but I, I could typically tell like in the first 10 minutes because they'll, they'll say something that like, I really like that person. Yeah. I actually hired somebody that had kind of no business being in, in the firm right now, and she had a, uh, like a residential background, like nothing that we did. And I just, I kind of talked to her and I looked at her and I thought, 
you know, there's something about that person that, that uh, I feel that she could make an impact. And, and for me, I'm looking for people to make impact. Um, and, and she's been with us for, for the last two years and, and it's been amazing. So um, you could tell. I think you should know the culture of the firm that you're going with and then understand that and then kind of figure out how you can fit in. I 100% agree. Just you, you can be yourself, you can be a shy person or an outgoing person, but definitely portray yourself as a friendly person or a kind person because you know we want to, we're working, we're, we're interviewing someone that's going to work with us uh, and it has to work within a team um, and existing culture, so I 100% agree. I think like what you guys just said is the ability to work on a team um, and to kind of push your passion through so that others can see it, especially in that first kind of critical 10 or 15 minutes. We want to see who you are as a person, not just as a designer. I think one of the most important things is to remember that we, we're interviewing you, but at the same time you're interviewing us, and you hear it very often from, from the people who interview. And, it's just really important because if you're showing, if you're asking the right questions that are really important to you, like, um, do you, are you guys out in the community? Are you having lunch and learns? Are you, um, how are you mentoring? You know, all of those types of questions, it shows us that you're really interested and engaged. And if you're at a firm that's not very responsive to those questions, then it may not be the firm for you and you may want to go somewhere else. So. I think having those questions to interview the people that are interviewing, we'll, we'll know how interested you are, but also you'll get to know if it's the right fit for you. Can I jump in there with the, um, that just going over projects, if you, if you don't have, again, I teach you as well, but if you don't have passion in that project and you're talking with your head down and you're kind of mumbling through, if you can get excited of what you're doing, you can get other people excited. So if it's very ho-hum and how you're dealing with it, if you don't show energy or excitement about you, that's your own project, I mean, what, what does that mean? And especially in the first five minutes, typically you're showing your best, the best of stuff. So it's gonna be upfront. You should, you should be very excited about what you're showing. Not excited where you're walking around and screaming, but uh, you know, express yourself and, and, and say, I really got into the project, you know, whatever the case is. Um, and I tend to see people that, that aren't like that. So you're thinking, man, if they're going to work f for me and they're not excited about their own project, then how's that, you know, how does that work? So be, be energetic. I would add also and to your point, you're not, you're not interviewing for a, a box. You're not interviewing for an exact set of parameters. You may, you may have those parameters on your resume, but you're, you're interviewing for those plus what else can you do for the firm? So seem inquisitive ask questions, seem interested, and seem like you're going to do your job, plus you're going to help expand things, make the firm better as a whole. Um, and I'll add, so The Power of Introverts by Susan Cain is an amazing book. So for the introverts in the room, because let's be honest, and we're not all extroverts, and not all of us were wired in our DNA to be extroverts. That's okay. You don't need to be up here with jazz hands. Like, I mean, you don't need, you know, for every project that you're trying to convey to a client. I like jazz hands. I, I, I talk my hands a lot. Um, so, and I am an extrovert. I can't help it. But, um, you know, but there's so many brilliantly talented introverts. And if that's who you are, own it. That's okay. Totally cool that you're an introvert. So, you know, you don't have to feel like you're living in an extroverted industry that, you know, not everybody is. Own your skill set. Um, what you bring to the table because the extroverts need you too. Um, and that, that book, if you haven't read it, highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's, it's really well done and it gets you thinking about you know, really what, what you bring to the table if you are that introvert. Now, as far as the work of a potential employee goes, what do you think makes someone's cover letter, resume, portfolio stand out to you, both in a negative way or a positive way? I would say in a negative way, if there's any spelling or grammar mistakes, that's a huge negative. Um, you know, it's, to me, it's inexcusable. You have all the time in the world to make it right. You need to make it right. It says something about how you portray yourself professionally, in my opinion. Um, and I, I think the cover letters tend to be sort of a throwaway. Like the resume is really important. The cover letter is just this formality. It's not. It's a distillation of your resume. So if you don't have that, so that means someone has to read your entire resume and try to figure out who you are. This is your opportunity to talk about who you are, 
what you can do, and cater it towards the, com towards the company you're interviewing for. So you should not have the same cover letter for two different jobs. There should be different cover letters because you have the opportunity now to say, okay, this firm I'm interviewing, interviewing for does hotels. I've done a hotel before. I'm going to say in the cover letter, I've done a hotel. And if this other firm has done something else, I'm going to say I've done this other thing. So that's, that's your chance to be able to talk about your experience um, and how you fit in that firm specifically. Graphic coordination, so between all the pages that you submit, just making sure that there's, you know, you can tell that it's from the same person from page one to page three and, you know, throughout your portfolio. It's huge. And I think, I think with that, sometimes we see logos and we see all, you know, a lot of time spent in certain things like that. And it's, it's okay sometimes as it's, if it's done tastefully, but really it, the cleaner, the better, the easier to read. People want to be able, really, we go, we go through these so quickly. People want to be able to look to see if you have experience. They want to see when you're graduating or, or, or if, you know, if you're in your sophomore year or if you already have worked somewhere. But it, keep, it, keep it very clean. Keep your points clean. Keep your portfolio and your cover letter. Everything easy to read is, would be something that I would... I think that, that easy to read kind of stuff, I, I agree with that. But I like personality in, in what you're showing. So yeah, don't make it too fancy, but you know, throw some personality in it. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're in the creative, so a little bit different the way you're gonna present yourself. So some kind of creativity, uh, but simplistically if you, can, uh, if you can make that work. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll speak to an example um, for a past company I worked with, uh, I was hiring. And the most memorable uh, experience I had, they had a great resume, they had a great portfolio. Um, and then the thank you note that I got the next day and lived in the area, obviously, so she hand delivered it. Um, but it was a chocolate bar because we talked about the best chocolate that we'd ever had. And, you know, again, the personality, the, like the personal touch. Um, so went and bought me my favorite candy, you know, chocolate bar and wrapped the thank you note around the candy bar and with her card again and just said, thank you for your time. I hired her. <laughs> um, but it was just that memorable, and I knew that you know what I was looking for in that team member that they're going to deliver personable or personal, thoughtful touches um, in their client deliverable. Um, so that was a, a winning factor for me. So how did you all determine that um, a workplace was right for you, either your first job or internship that you got, or the job that you have now? One of the first jobs I had was at a, a firm that was family run, but they did, they did nice work. Super formal, super formal. They locked the, uh, the fax machine at five o'clock and we couldn't finish our projects. You'd have to go to King Coast to do it. So it was, it was run, you know, very, um, I, I guess, more business-like uh, in a way or more strict, I guess. Um, and I, I just thought that's how it was. And so I interviewed at a company where uh, it was in a lofted building I saw kids running around, I saw dogs, I saw people watching the World Cup, and I just thought that was the strangest place to be. <laughs> uh, that was the place I wanted to be. And um, uh, I got there, and it was an amazing experience with super talented people, and um, that's how I based my firm uh, on, is, is you're gonna work there, and I, I actually see my employees more than I see my family, which is not really a great thing. Um, but I want them to have fun because you're working a lot. Uh, but if you can have fun and do great work, it's not like coming to work. So it was really very easy for me to come to work there. Uh, easy to stay late. Food was available when it was late. Uh, fun people. Um, you know, watch the World Cup. I mean, how, how much you know? How much fun can you have doing that? So f for me, again, you have to check out what you need to see. And some environments will be really crazy. Some will be a lot more conservative. Find what fits best for you, um, and 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 that'll be your place, hopefully. Uh, I'll add on that that my my recent experience. I've actually only been with Hayworth for about six months, so it's a, it's a pretty new um, move for me. Um, when I was going through the interview process, because I was going through interviews with a couple different companies, um, and in the process, I I met with the leadership team. I met people at corporate and just blown away by the talent and amazing things happening. But 
um, you know, what I asked for is like, can I meet with some of the local team members? Because that local team for me was critical. Um, how, what's that chemistry going to be like? Are we going to jive together? Or are we going to, you know, be able to do the things that we need to do in our jobs and do them successfully? Um, so I asked for in the interview process, can I have the team members that I would would be my peers? Um, can I meet them first, and then I'll make my decision? Um, and so that was what sold me to move forward with Hayworth. But that's just an anecdote for me that you know maybe per, perhaps if you're meeting in firms and you really love whoever your manager might be, you know, maybe I'll also try to meet other people in the firm and see you know, those personalities and how you might connect and interact with those people. One of the things that I look for in the firms that I've been in, in addition to having, having fun, you want to work hard, play hard, um, but is having a mentor. And I think from the very, you know, from school, but all the way through every job, I've always looked for somebody in my firm that I've worked with that is a mentor to me because we're always learning, we're always growing, and um, it's okay to make mistakes, but having somebody to kind of guide you or not really hold your hand so that you can't explore, but someone to just ask questions to. And I think as you start to go, as you start to get older and older, being that mentor for somebody else, it's just kind of paying it forward on that. So I think mentorship is one thing that I've always looked for in a firm. Well, um, I have a few things, but um, the, the biggest one is collaboration uh, with your teammates. It's so important to not only like your team and love your team because you're spending so much time with them, but also being able to collaborate with them well. Um, especially as an interior designer, um, out of, I think we have five interior designers at Perkins Eastman right now in the Chicago office out of 30. The rest are architects. Um, it's important to work with the architects and there should be this synergy that um, not, I feel like in my experience, not a lot of firms do really well, but when you find it, you know it. And that's kind of why I've stuck around at Perkins East Eastman for so long. I just enjoy, I enjoy the collaboration. For me personally, I've worked at a, I started out of school at a smaller firm that did core shell and interiors. Um, I worked there for about six years and moved on, to, moved on to New York. I lived in Boston originally, I forgot to mention that part. Um, and when I moved to New York, I wanted to try something that was very different deliberately. So I moved, did a, a sort of commercial interiors, high-end interiors for several years. Um, when I came to Chicago, I uh, wanted to try something that was very different from that. So I uh, did uh, big commercial, uh, corporate, core shell architecture. And so now I'm at Harley Ellis Devereaux and it's a good mix. It's a good balance. So I would just say, you know, try your hand at different types of firms to gain some perspective. You don't really know. You may be someone who loves working corporate interiors and you want to work at, you know, just prestigious firms and that's it. Or maybe you want to work in a small place with a couple people and it's very family oriented. You really don't know. So, you know, move around a little bit, gain some perspective and try things out. Now, Ferdinand, I know you just mentioned that you sometimes spend more time with your employees than you do your own family. So I'm curious, how do you all balance your professional lives with your personal lives? Or is there, is there a balance? You don't. Communicate. <laughs> you don't. Yeah. Communicate. Uh, yeah. At least, right. so in, in our speak at, at, at Hayworth, um, you know, we don't even talk about work-life balance anymore. That's kind of a way of the past, that now it's work-life integration. Um, and so that is the push for interior spaces, that they need to function for work and life, if that makes sense. So not to have such a stark dis uh, disconnect from a residential feel or hospitality feel, places you <laughs> truly want to be in and relax and, and have comfort. Um, you know, then you have a, a stark contrast to that of in, in a, in a traditional um, you know, contract space, commercial space, so that there's this nice blend. Um, so I guess as far as work-life integration, for, for me, um, it's, it's picking the right place that I feel I have flexibility and, and variety, that I, I have um, autonomy to be able to you know, not be on the clock, like you know, only from this time to this time I'm chained to a desk. If it was a culture like that, it wouldn't work for me. Um, I need I need to have flexibility and, and um, also be given um, the accountability. You know, I'm accountable for the work I produce. 
So if that makes sense. I would just I would say the uh, the strains of uh, deadlines can be very can be very chaotic. So try to put some kind of rhythm to that chaos. Um, and you know, I was saying communication before. I try to communicate with my family. Try to do the same with yours. And uh, something I do is I just say, okay, I know I have to work 70 hours this week. That's the, that's what I probably have to do to get this project these projects out for the next several weeks. So I will just work late Mondays and Tuesdays. And then my family knows that. They know what to expect. Then it's not just random 10-hour, 12-hour days throughout the week and weekends. You know, do work hard on a certain amount of days. Or just set, set some kind of rhythm or expectations. I think it's important to ask the question when you're on an interview. I think some of the panelists um, mentioned, you know, it's important to ask questions when you're on an interview. That's a really valid question to ask is, you know, how how does the firm, you know, work with late hours if there's a deadline? Like, how often do you have deadlines like that where you're expected to work late? Um, hopefully they would be honest. Um, different firms are more flexible than others. So it's just, it's a matter of finding the right, the right place for you. Um, and just being up front with them and asking the question. You know, we schedule, uh, we schedule uh, during the beginnings of the week. So we're scheduling 40 to 45 hours uh, a week, which I don't think is, is out of hand. And obviously there's those times that you have to do the 70 hours. Um, but I think if you can mix some play in that, uh, you know, go out, do events. We're actually doing Jeopardy over at Hayworth <laughs> next week. Uh, but do things and get out. Uh, we are over by Grant Park as well, so I encourage guys to, you know, take the computer, mark of drawings, um, you know, get out to the park. It, it's okay. So the, the way I try to treat the, the employee is to say, you're professional, we have a deadline. If you, if you do that at home or if you do that wherever you do that, you know when it's due. So putting that responsibility on them and however you get there, take a two-hour lunch, go take a run, go work out, come back watch a movie, however you do it, you know, just keep people aware of what's happening, but put the responsibility on yourself because typically you are setting those deadlines um, so you know where, where you have to work. Um, so a lot of times I think you just need the break. Um, it, it, different as a business owner, I think I work a lot more and I, I, I feel like that's, it's just my own baby. But at the end of the day, I'm super sensitive to my team um, we do travel and things of that nature. We get home late. Hey, you worked a lot. You know, come in the afternoon tomorrow. Hey, by the way, you spent more than your hours of, of work. Don't come in today. Those kind of things. And I think people tend to appreciate that, and they 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 um, end up working even harder for that, knowing that they're appreciated. So I think those little, you know, give me's um, are, are a great thing, and I think that's why you how you can balance it. Um, as you mentioned, it, it, taking a break is really important. And after so long, your brain gets so tired and dead, and, and then you really not you're not producing what you actually could be producing. And so it is important to take that mental break, just stop, to go for a run, or go for a walk, or do something. But then after a after a deadline, reward yourself. You know, do something because the next deadline will be coming. That's just the, the nature of the beast. So you, got, you really have, in our profession, you do have to, you work really hard, but you have to play really hard. And um, to just taking a break for something that you like to do because you don't want to get burnt out. That's, you know, it's so fun. This profession is fun, but you, you do want to enjoy it as well. Now, what kind of advice would you give to someone who feels like they are kind of stuck in a position that they feel is a bad fit for them early on in their career? Can any of you speak to that? I think you're, uh, you, you know, you're, you're committed to, to, to something at a point. And I think people tend to see that. So if that was a decision that, that you made to go there, then you, you need to stay with it at least, I think, at least a year. Um, I know it's difficult. Uh, but learn as much as you can learn, but at, at least stay a year. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think the other thing is, um, if you aren't happy with what you're doing, some people, you know, the term pigeonholed, if you're in that position, the, you're the only one who can make the decisions and make changes for yourself. And so speaking up to your supervisor or a mentor or somebody and say, hey, I, you know, 
I'm noticing this, is it possible to get into this or do something? And give it that year's time frame. And if you're still stuck and you're really not happy, then maybe it is a time for a change for you. But um, it is a, it's a balance between commitment and you, you kind of have to work, work your own way up and what you want to do and no one will do that for you. Yeah, you kind of have to look at your career holistically. I mean, you didn't, hopefully you didn't just take this job because it would give you a salary. You took it because it would enhance you professionally and sort of work towards your goal 25 years from now. So, I mean, it's, you kind of have to look at that. And if you're still gaining anything professionally by working there, even if it's hard or boring or whatever, or you're not doing exactly what you want to do in this minute, just try to look at it, you know, in the future. And if, uh, if it's still valuable, then try to stick with it. Now, what are some key professional cues that someone entering into a new job or new internship should keep in mind, especially both in the office and in social events with coworkers? What are some key professional cues that they should keep in mind? This industry is small, even though it seems probably in your shoes right now very big. Um, people know each other, so I would say that even if you might be frustrated or it might not be the right fit or wherever you are in kind of your mental health of your career at the moment, um, be really professional and positive at all times in social settings, um, networking events, even around your coworkers. Um, I mean, there's studies that, that I've seen that it's just it's amazing of how many people that are toxic inside of an organization, and that would be an firm too, right, in companies, um, that if you see those people, try not to let them bring you down with them, um, they exist. And so, I don't know, sorry, I'm going on a bit of a tangent, but um, you know, just to, to be, be positive, be confident, and be um, better than people that might start to feel, make everything feel very negative around them. That's it's part, I think uh, what I'm hearing, it's 75% of people working are disengaged with work. Is that Se what you're reading? 70. 70, yeah. something like that, yeah. uh, which is pretty horrible. <laughs> Uh, so I, I engage. It's you. It's up to you. How do you make it better? And that's what the panelists were saying. Make it better. Struggle through it. I think that builds character. That builds experience. Um, you'll know what you like. So uh, kind of work through that. But um, I, I think you got to. Sometimes you got to. You got to go through that. We have clients like that. You know, you're not going to quit on them. You're going to finish it. Be professional and move on. But you probably won't do a work for that person again. So you you just learn. You live. You kind of learn it. It's, it's easy when you work at a, at a firm to, you'll see someone acting up, you're gonna see someone dressing a certain way, you're gonna see someone drunk. Um, and that's not you, don't do that. You're, you know, there's some of the things, <laughs> if, you, if you see someone um, who's acting, you know, a little bit unprofessionally or maybe dressing a certain way, or just be one step ahead of them professionally because you don't have the same, you don't know if they're one of the partner's nephews you don't know if they've done something to save the firm 10 years ago and they're just viewed as really great. They can, and they can get away with it. You probably can because you just got the job. So if, just, I would say you know, you're going to see it all the time. You're going to be out at a bar networking and people are going to be acting up. It's a, like you said, it's a small world. Don't, don't uh, participate. I think there's a, yeah. the professional cue is um, you can talk to vendors and manufacturers and you know, what firm is, is is fun to work with, what, who does really cool work. Um, that's a good resource, you can ask that kind of question. Uh, there was a time as I'm looking around and I see someone consistently out. Those are the kind of guys that get <clears throat> kind of noticed because you're thinking, well, they're either you know, like going out or they're trying to business develop or make contacts. So um, if you're out all the time and you're being out and you're introducing or you're volunteering, um, I think those are strong assets to, to get involved with. Uh, and, and, and professionally, as a professional cue, is I, I think you you do talk to the vendors. Yeah, yeah, it, you know, it's important. I mean, gosh, we're in Neocon right now, so there's lots of parties that have been happening the last week. <laughs> it's like they started for us last Thursday. Um, just so important to limit any career career limiting behavior um, and be so cognizant because you'll you'll see it. I mean, people will be you know, it's social industry. So just because other people might be having a too good of a time and that it might be okay in that setting, I would, there's always eyes around the room or if there's somebody that you might meet and it might not be um, you know, somebody that you're a prospect of, of trying to get into their firm that moment, but perhaps that could let, leave a lasting impression for when you are interviewing with them across the table. Um, so 
just keep that in mind um, as well as I was talking about just being emotionally expensive to a firm. You don't want to be having that reputation either. So just staying positive and, and professional at all times is so, so important because I said small industry, people know each other and people do talk. It's, it's a relationship business. So Treat consultants and sales reps as if you know, you're in their shoes because at the end of the day, as much as you want to think that you're not going to make a mistake, you will, and they're the ones who are going to help and bail you out. Um, so treat them as a team player, you know, because they are on your team and they always will be as long as you treat them right. Now, what are some of the most valuable lessons that you all learned in your first few years of your career? And if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, what are some of the mistakes that you all made your first few years of your career? I have a really good one. <laughs> um, so we were doing FF&E for a 21-story tower, and each floor, um, the elevator lobby had a completely different um, furniture arrangement, all different chairs, all different fabrics, consoles, lamps, and everything. And so basically it was 21 sets of everything. So I tried my darndest to find 21 different table lamps that would work well with the design. And I overlooked the size of one. And instead of it arriving on site as a table lamp, it arrived on site, I'm sorry, instead of it arriving on site as a floor lamp, it arrived on site as a table lamp. And there was only one of them, and we had a console, and there was no way to make it, there was no way to make it work. So we just, you know, we had to pick another table lamp. But in that instance, who helped us was, you know, the sales rep for that company. So it's always, you know, it's always really, really important that you, you know, maintain those relationships um, and double check dimensions. <laughs> um. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer to your, your first part of your question. Um, one of the things I felt most valuable was setting goals, and I know it kind of came up before a little bit, but um, something that I was taught when I was in school um, very early is, is just setting those goals for the short term, you know, one year out where you want to be, what you want to be doing, and then five years out, and then 10 years out. And, it's amazing how fast time goes, but um, looking back on where I, how I accomplished that year goal and then now back where I was five years, and I think that's something very, very valuable. You can, because time does pass and you'll, before you know it, you'll be at a firm for four years and you may still be in the same place. And in, unless you're setting those goals for yourself, you may not know what you're actually accomplishing. I was going to say the same thing, and I think um, your exams are a great way to do that. I mean, they are, they're, they're menacing, and sometimes they're a pain, and they take up your time, but they're also a great way to track where you're at. So, I mean, if I, I'm a registered architect, you're taking your exams, I mean, it's going to, getting the experience and then studying for those exams is a good way to sort of take your own temperature to see where you are in your career, and if you've been looking down and doing one thing for too long, you're like, wait a minute, I should be doing more construction administration. I didn't realize that until I started tracking my hours. I mean, that's, that's a good way of doing it. So, you know, look up once in a while, work hard, but see where you're at. Make sure you're on the right track. Uh, we talked about confidence earlier. There's, there's confidence and then there's uh, overconfidence. So I would say when, you, when you're learning something and you don't know the answer, it's okay to say, let, let me get back to you on that, as opposed to answering something that's totally wrong. Um, and it, it it, it's more effective, obviously. So I, I think where people are making up things and trying to say you can do this and you can that, uh, it, it's probably better to defer and hold off. There's nothing wrong with that. I'll get back to you by the you know, end of the day. Um, so don't, don't be afraid to hold back on certain things like that. Um, I think that's one of the young things that I was in, learned from, really. What is the most challenging for, thing for you in your careers right now at this point? For me, it's... Um moving up. So I, I think for anybody, when you move up to a new position, you're going to start at an intern level and move up to a designer level, then maybe a project architect level, I'm just naming levels. They, um, it's, it's hard because you get really good at doing a certain thing, which makes you a good, in my case, a project architect, and then you will, uh, the, someone will promote you to being a project manager, and it's hard to let go of those reins. 
Um, so that's, that, that to me is really challenging right now to sort of you know, take a step away from something that I got really good at or learned about uh, and spent a lot of time doing and uh, growing into the next position. I'd, I'd say one thing for me personally is um, having gone from working at an architecture firm um, and the project time span, how you'd be on the same project for two years or three years or that's now still under construction from four years ago, um, to where I am now with Gary Lee Partners, we the projects are, are quicker. In interior design, sometimes they'll turn around a lot quicker. Um, it's a great experience. You're on site, all, we were just talking before, is you're on site all the time. You're getting great construction administration experience and, and phasing, but um, for me, it's just been, it's been a transition of multiple projects, six projects at once, where I'm, before I was used to one. And it's a great experience. It's just a, it, it's that challenge of, um, in between, so. Now, kind of on the flip side of the question that I just asked, how are you all trying to grow in your careers today um, in the design industry? Um, I know for me, it's really important to always stay engaged and to never stop learning. So I've always kind of made it a point where, you know, if I get to a certain stage in my career and I feel kind of stagnant, I will go to somebody in my firm and, and make sure that I'm picking up something new. Um, so just always staying engaged and learning as you go because there's so much to learn. You're never going to know everything. Um, so in theory, you should always be in that position. You should never be just kind of doing the same thing every day, day in and day out, because that's, that's how you get bored and unhappy with your, your career. I'm a learner as well, and um, I've been practicing for over 20 years, um, consistently looking at things, um, not going to restaurants the way uh, a, a regular person would go, but going to restaurants because how is the lighting? How are things set up? Where are the switches? What, what are they doing? Um, so, so to me is always the experience. It's almost, it, it's a never ending process. Uh, so I don't really enjoy uh, as much of the, the, the background of it because what I'm, what I'm doing is really learning. It's le keep learning. So we're doing a project in uh, New York, uh, actually in Chicago. The client was out in New York and um, it's this uh, ancient spa. I mean, some just really beautiful spa that they're gonna do here in Chicago. And so the client had given us the, the treatment to just check it out. So you're trying to relax. And I kind of, instead of relaxing, I'm thinking, how is that attached? What are they doing with that? And, and so it, 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 was, it was weird. So I find myself always doing that. And no matter how old you are, I, I, I keep feeling like I continuing learning. I encourage the learning from the younger end. And they're teaching me uh, as, as much as you know, hopefully I'm mentoring them. And I think that's just as important. Uh, as you get older, never close your eyes to you know, uh, saying you know enough. It's always just, what else can I learn? What's new? What's, what's different? So um, yes, they, these guys brought it up. It's a continuous process, however old you get. And I think people become uh, recognized in the profession when they're older because there's this light that clicks and you're like, I kind of get this now. I mean, there's so much to learn, but all of a sudden you kind of get probably the holistic aspect of it, uh, and you feel comfortable, and it's not as foreign a as when you're going through it, but that happens after a lot, of, uh, a lot of experience, I guess. Now, my final question for you all as the panel, um, before I open up the floor to any questions from our audience, is I, for those of you that are members of IIDA or have been involved with IIDA before, how has this involvement with IIDA um, changed your careers or impacted your career? Um, well, I, I actually joined IIDA probably when I was a student in New York, and when I, when I moved out here um, during the recession, um, it was really, really tough meeting people, um, getting informational interviews, and so I decided to join a committee to kind of, you know, amp up my involvement a little bit. Well, that committee kind of turned into a board position, and then that board position turned into the, a president role. And what being on the IIDA Illinois board has done for me um, is, I mean, so many things, but in general, it's given me opportunities that I would not have gotten um, otherwise just being at my firm. Um, I've definitely experienced a lot, um, you know, professional development, 
um, public speaking, um, getting to know people that I would not have met otherwise, um, and working with people that aren't necessarily at my firm. Um, so working in a volunteer role um, with other people at different firms or different companies, it's, it's a great you know, exercise for you and your career. Any uh, professional organization that you can get involved with, um, and again, being exposed to other people, other, other colleagues in the industry, um, is, is, is definitely a, a benefit this, this young in the industry. So whether it's IIDA or AIA or, or, or whatever it is, I, I highly recommend. Uh, that's where you make the connections uh, and, and, and really uh, kind of move along in your career. Because you, you may be at some place uh, that you don't necessarily love and meet somebody somewhere else and they talk about how great it is and uh, can tell you there's an opportunity there. So you'll, you don't want to miss out on those opportunities. So um, for, for that you know, reason in its own, I think it's probably worth it. Thing I would say is it's it's actually really inspiring um, going to Hillary is the president she puts on different events and it's inspiring to go to these events and listen to speakers and um, just being around just being around people similar to you but you you are learning and, and it's it's crazy because you could have a really down day at work and you're stressed out but you go to something like this and then you remember why you love what you're doing and I think that's one of the values of these um, of these organizations. So, did did we have any questions in the audience for the panel? Hi, uh, my name is Tara Headley. I just graduated with my MFA from SCAD in Atlanta. A uh, question is for Ferdinand in particular. Um, you had mentioned that you try to have that balance in your workplace of not having everyone work too hard or trying to find that fine line between you know working hard and having that balance so how are some of the ways that you do that in your firm for your employees so um, so recently I, I, I my team is uh, I can't do what I can do without my team and so uh, you know just going through the the industry through the years and um, I look back at people and how they've influenced where we're at right now, and I see how important that is. So um, just recently, I, I kind of put the surprise together, and my original intent was to get my team eye watches, and so I called Apple. They weren't able to do that. They said you could only buy two watches at a time because I guess people buy it and they sell it. So I had to figure out a way now, how, how do I do this? Because I wanted it to just be a surprise. So basically, I had to send a blind email to everybody and say there's a really important meeting on Friday, and I know you have summer hours, but you have to attend. And little did I know that they all started talking and thought either we were closing or merging and got scared, <laughs> uh, and I was trying to make it fun, um, and then announced that, you know, basically, I appreciate all your work and, and everything there and that uh, we went over to the um, ice store. They, they had a, an amazing conference room that we got to try the watches and fit our watches. Um, but to do things off the cuff or do things like that, um, to show your appreciation to people, uh, I, I, I don't think you can do things you know, without that team. So I, I like fun things like that or trips to Vegas. Hello, I'm Maria Vondrasic. I'm a design student at Michigan State University. Um, I was curious as to what computer programs your companies primarily use. I know we're trying to learn everything, but between SketchUp, Revit, and AutoCAD, what you'd say is the most important to know? Revit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Revit. Okay, thank you. We still, we still yeah, use, um, <laughs> oh, I, I just would like to say we do use CAD and Revit, and I, I am a firm believer in, it's, it is really important to understand CAD, which is drafting. Um, you know, everything is by computers every day now, but it's, it's really important how to, when you put a line on paper, what that, pa what that line means and where it goes. So if, if you're cutting a section, it's important to know how that section is created. And if you move that line, and, and Revit is amazing, trust me, I, I love it. And it, it's great at putting sets together. But for the details, I think it's really important for you still to keep that drafting mentality, whether it's hand sketching or CAD. Hi, I'm Jenna. I just recently graduated from the University of North Texas. Um, my question is more geared to interviewing as an entry level 
um, position and how you kind of approach and organize that. You know, I'm hoping to interview with perhaps a handful of companies, but how does that really work if you get, I don't know, let's say four offers, but you're an entry level, and how much time do you have to respond and just kind of organizing that and responding to the offer? Uh, in our office, we've kind of, um, for, for more uh, senior level people, I have somebody else look at that. For um, new grads and, and interns, we have somebody else look at that. Um, but in terms of organizing how that goes, you, you're probably organizing it on, you know, what's your favorite place? You know, which one do you want to do? No matter what, I think you respond to, to all of them. And whether you say, hey, can I give you uh, till the rest of the weekend or whatever that takes, or if you're really waiting for that other firm to respond, um, you know, tell them I need to make a decision within, you know, whatever the days are. So just keep communications, inform people uh, uh, how you want, may, may want to approach that. But yes, respond, communicate, and, and I think that's probably the best way to deal with that. Yeah. Just ask, the, ask for the amount of time you think you need to be able to respond respectfully to all of them. And if you're waiting on, as Fernand points out, if you're waiting for the one that you really like, don't tell them that. Just, you know, be polite. If you need a little more time, you think you're going to get something, you know, ask for a little more time if you think it's worth it. Uh, but make sure you stay in contact with the one you really like as well. Follow up with them. If you do get an offer from somebody, but you want to hold out to say yes or no until you hear from the firm that you really want, I think you can push that firm that you really want and leverage you know, the offer that you've already gotten and say, look, I've already got an offer from, you know, XYZ company, but I really, really, really am interested in, you know, you. Is there any way that we can talk, you know, sooner rather than later about, you know, any offer that you might be willing to provide? So. Yeah. I was about to add, totally acceptable to tell an employer, potential employer, you have other offers on the table and, and leverage it, negotiate it, be firm, confident about that, that's okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Nancy. I'm currently pursuing my Master in Interior Architecture at UCLA. Um, so I wanted to ask, I know how integral and important internships are during you know, your studies. However, unfortunately for international students, we can only work afterwards. So is there anything we can do to not necessarily make up for the lack of internships. Oh, I wasn't speaking before. Um, but, you know, try to show that we actually care and we are trying in other ways. Thank you. You can shadow people. So most, most of the time, if any student, you know, contacts us at Perkins Eastman and they want to do a shadow day, we absolutely will do it. So I think you can contact firms that, you, um, that you're interested in and try to shadow them for a day. Um, maybe you do it, you know, a couple times a month or something for a set amount of time um, for, you know, a few different firms. But that way, at least you're kind of getting to know what, what the practice is like and what different firms are like. Hi, I'm Natika from Conestoga College in Toronto. And so one of the questions I always get stuck on when I'm networking is what projects are you currently working on? And I know so many firms get, they're so like, oh my God, we don't want to talk about that. So it just gets awkward. I'm just wondering if that question bothers you or do you think it's a good question to ask? <laughs> it's kind of like a date. It's like getting to know somebody, like ask questions that are familiar to each other. Like, have you been here before? Or something, something to, that sparks more of a social conversation rather than just work immediately, like what's your firm like and what are you working on, et cetera. And then it kind of just comes in the conversation. All right, I think we have time for just one more question. Hi, my name is Chelsea. Um, I am a senior at Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota. Um, last question. If you were in our shoes again, knowing the experience that you know now, what would you have done differently? Taken more classes in 3D modeling. I think I would have asked for uh, uh, a mentor. Um, I think on my own, I kind of just learned my way through. Um, so I, I tend to put myself out there a little bit more now than, because I understand people might not want to ask that question, but um, probably, you know, so for some guidance. So actually, even, even nowadays as I meet uh, business owners or people who have been in business a long time, it's always like, you know, what did you learn from that? Uh, can you share some experiences? Um, 
So I think a mentor would have been something I would have asked for early. Yeah. Um, actually, I actually always thought about this. I wish I would have either dual majored um, in, in business, whether that be marketing um, or even uh, dual major within graphics, um, branding, those types of things. So that's the passions of mine that I kind of had when I was a, a student, and I realized how much um, that could parallel into what I'm doing today. So if I had to go back and do it again. Yeah. I, I agree with Melissa. If I and, and everyone is different in the route that they go. Some people want to be the star designer and some people want to own a firm and, and may, or manage or um, et cetera. But I would, I would have done my um, a dual masters in business just because it gives you that side. There's so much more to architecture and interior design than just pretty pictures and, and um, it's important, you know, contracts and proposals, et cetera. That's a part of our, our daily lives. and. Um, just having that business side with clients, I guess, would be something. It's a computer program that you talked about earlier. Somebody did Excel. <laughs> Sadly, I mean, I would imagine that you guys are do. I feel like we collaborate on projects through Excel documents as far as pricing goes and playing with numbers and moving numbers into different buckets. If it lives in the architectural budget, does it live in the furniture budget? Does it live in the, you know, anyways, there's, it, there's always a puzzle to getting a project done on, on time and um, on, on budget. And that's a big part of making a client happy um, are, is the business side of it. So keep that in mind. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming out to the 2015 IADA Career Bootcamp. And thank you to our wonderful panel. And we'll see you all next year at the 2016 IDA Career Boot Camp at Neocon. Thank you, guys.